Hi, I'm Takoa De Silva with Sprott Global Resource Investments, and I'm sitting down here again today with Rick Rule, Chairman of Sprott U.S. Holdings. Rick, good to see you. Thanks for the opportunity, Takoa. What I'd like to ask you about today is uh, the mathematics, uh, or what are the mathematics of a resource portfolio, starting out with the math behind discovery probabilities. So to start with, how would you define a discovery and what are a few of the most significant discoveries that you have participated in throughout your career? Well, there's different definitions of discovery depending on whether, whether you're an investor or a speculator. There are some traders, as an example, who can make money on one drill hole, which of course does not make a mine. Uh, working with Sprott, uh, working with much larger accounts, my definition of a discovery would be the delineation of uh, enough ore of sufficient quality that it could be put into uh, commercial production. And mercifully, we've participated in numerous of those uh, in the last 30 years in Sprott and its predecessors. Some of, the, uh, some of the ones that come to mind are, of course, the famous Arequipa discovery in Peru. But there's, there, there's been, I'm going to say, probably 20, 25 that we've participated in the last three decades in here. Mm -hmm. Rick, uh, sometimes I'll speak with people on the phone, and I'm sure you've heard this all throughout your career, uh, someone who has maybe ten or twenty thousand dollars and wants to buy four or five exploration stocks and make a discovery. But I also heard you uh, note that within one of the earlier partnerships that you participated in 108 private placements with only six producing the type of stellar gains that newsletter writers talk about as a result of discovery. And I'm wondering if we can talk about the probability of success in that sense. Well, I think that's accurate. That isn't to say that I only made money on six stocks of 108 in that portfolio. I made more money. Uh, I made money uh, on more than that. But it's important to note that uh, very large discoveries, the type of discoveries that make you 20-fold or 30-fold or even 100-fold returns, are fairly scarce. And speculators need to understand that they're going to have to move through a lot of opportunities to make those type of discoveries. To put it in context, Tacoa, uh, economic geologists will tell you that somewhere between a thousand, one in a thousand, and one in five thousand uh, mineralized anomalies becomes a mine. Now, you can shift the odds in your favor by participating in exploration efforts that are run by absolutely A quality explorationists, or participating in exploration activities that take place in areas that are unpopular, like the Congo, and haven't been studied much. But the truth is that the odds are long against success. People need to understand that exploration, that exploration uh, speculation is a process. Uh, it, it can take a substantial amount of time. Is the process, Rick, a part of a, a shotgun approach of a buying just a whole bunch of explorers? Or is it extremely diligent uh, due diligence on each one of them and then still facing the uh, Very, very, very focused. The truth is that a limited number of people uh, enjoy most of the success. And so focusing on people who have enjoyed success in the past is important. Another thing that's very important is focusing on potentially large discoveries. A small discovery has all the risk of a large discovery but yields a small gain. The most difficult thing for most people to wrap their heads around is that most of the easy to find discoveries in places that we're comfortable with, like the United States, Canada, and Australia have been made. You have to go further afield to have the probability of large discoveries. And many speculators are uncomfortable with places they couldn't find on a map, or if they could, places that would scare them. Rick, um, you've been credited for coining a term in the mineral space, which is the prospect generator model, which from what I understand uh, <laughs> comes from the energy. Uh, space and I'm wondering if you can talk about the prospect generator model and then the sole risk exploration model. What are the differences between them? Those the prospect generator, uh, which you might have alluded to, is the process of discovery that I favor. Involves a group of geoscientists and business people who use their specific acumen to develop exploration theories and stake ground and then bring in third parties to do the heavy lifting of exploration, at least the heavy lifting of exploration funding. The downside of this approach is that the prospect generator gives up some or most of the project in return for obtaining the funding. The upside is that most of the value in small exploration companies is actually in the human capital. 
uh, of the people assembled that make up the company. And given that the chance of success on any one exploration property is small, maintaining your equity in the intellectual capital rather than having that diluted away to raise money to explore an individual property is the process of financing exploration, which has work, worked for me. An example of this, Tacoa, is if you take the uh, low range of the probabilities that I said with regards to exploration success, one in a thousand, and you juxtapose that to the success that I've had backing prospect generators, which is something over 20 discoveries in 55 or 56 attempts, you'll see that the probabilities of success, at least in my experience with prospect generator, in, with prospect generators, pardon me, are almost immeasurably greater than they are with sole risk exploration. That doesn't mean that sole risk exploration can't work. Sole risk exploration speculation in bear markets like these can work fairly well because the competition that you face in trying to buy a company after they've made the initial discovery, after they've had a successful drill hole, can be very low. But if you practice this technique in bull markets when you're competing with tens of thousands of speculators, you're almost certain to lose. Rick, I, I think I've heard you use the analogy of a, of a cover charge when it comes to, uh, I guess in this instance, exploration companies. Does that, I guess, help bail out maybe a, a mistake uh, or a non-discovery uh, where one hoped to have had one? Absolutely. It magnifies the upside. Uh, this morning I was uh, negotiating an investment with a small Australian company that has a $700,000 Australian market cap. That's about 500, 550,000 US. That same company would have had a six or seven million dollar market capitalization uh, in the bull market. Two things, your money can go further in uh, markets where the market capitalizations are minuscule like this. But much more importantly, when the sector returns to favor, not only will the small company be worth more, but a discovery will be more. So the idea that you would diversify your risk among small companies now and enjoy their return to favor is one that's worked for me in prior cycles. Rick, do you find that the prospect generator model, uh, do they apply the uh, option approach to one or two or three properties, or do you find them generally having large volumes of uh, properties? And one company that we own a lot of here, as an example, Eurasian Minerals, uh, I think has probably put 120 properties uh, in its lifespan through the exploration process. That's 120 properties that were explored with other people's money. They have enjoyed um, merchant banking style success where they have enjoyed some exploration success and sold it to the company sold it to another company and driven on, which is the way that they have managed to continue to explore over time. And so, uh, you know, I, I think uh, what you're looking for is owning a portfolio of sort of five to ten prospect generators that originate four or five projects a year, farm out two or three projects a year, and get two or three projects a year drilled. The idea with that is that in a portfolio sense, you are uh, exploring 15 to 20 projects a year mostly using other people's money. And then in a sense synthetically replicating some of your uh, mathematical success in, in doing 108 private placements and having great success with just six, a person can do that with two or three or four or five project generator model uh, prospect generator model companies? That's the idea. In particular, and we've discussed this before Tacoa, um, financing the prospect generators, that is taking private placements and prospect generators, they don't often need money, but they need money more often in poor markets where it's tough to find joint venture partners in good markets. So accredited investors that have the opportunity to participate in prospect generators and can magnify their wins with warrants, particularly long-term warrants, probably is statistically the best way to participate in exploration speculation. Mm -hmm. Rick, I've also uh, heard you speak about good starts or decent starts. Uh, when we move a little bit, uh, out, let's say, down the pyramid of speculation towards the advanced stage development companies, how do the probabilities of success change there when you're dealing with a company that looks like they have something decent in the ground? Gets much better. Uh, again, this is a game that you have to play in bad markets because in good markets, the competition uh, for uh, successful efforts in exploration gets very high. 
But uh, making money in exploration, Tokoa, involves speculating on the answers to unanswered questions. Uh, it might be in the context of an exploration company that they have discovered, uh, if you will, uh, a surface expression of mineralization. And they need to trench it down to a couple meters to see if that expression uh, continues at depth. It might be that having determined that it uh, continues at depth that they want to see that it extends a long strike and find the width, so they run a grid of trenches. That might be the second unanswered question. Let's assume that that's successful too, and now they have a, a, a legitimate drill hole target. They have potentially economic exploration over potentially good widths with a, with a lot of strike length, but they want to see the third dimension. They want to put a drill hole into it. If you're in a market where you get a discovery grade drill hole, that is economic widths of potentially economic grade, one of the wonderful things that can happen in a bear market is that that discovery is greeted by the market with a yawn. And you have the ability to analyze the information. Uh, think about the information in the context of the other geological information available to you. Peruse the management, look at the income statement, look at the balance sheet. You have the time uh, to make up your mind as to whether you want to accept that speculation, uh, a luxury that certainly isn't available in good markets. This is the market condition that sole risk exploration, particularly for more advanced projects, what I call successful efforts speculation works. I guess getting back to that, the idea of investing in the sole risk ex explorers, uh, what's the ideal portfolio size for a person who wants to play in that arena? Can you do that with ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars or do you really have to bump up to a few hundred thousand? Again, in a market like this you can do it with ten or twenty or thirty thousand dollars. One of the things that happens if you're doing successful efforts exploration rather than generative or grassroots exploration is that you uh, have a lower probability of failure, uh, although the magnitude of your win is also reduced. But e employing $25,000 as an example with five bets of $5,000 each is perfectly feasible in the type of market that we're, of, that we're in today. The upside that you're going to enjoy with any individual success will be less than the upside that you would enjoy with a grassroots virgin discovery and a smaller market capitalization. But it's a very viable speculative technique. So um, if we get back to the idea of the advanced stage uh, project uh, space, when you're looking at companies that have, let's say, identified a few uh, million ounces of gold or uh, 50, 100 million ounces of silver, as an example, what, um, again, when we look at probability, if we have 10 or 15 of those companies, are all 10 or 15 going to make it? Certainly not. Uh, understand that all ounces aren't created equal. Uh, a 4 million ounce gold deposit, a very low grade in remote terrain with bad metallurgy, is a science project. Uh, a one million ounce deposit that's accessible, that's fairly high grade and is mineable, might turn out to be extremely viable. The, the truth is, again, remember that mostly money is made in exploration through the answering of unanswered questions. In a circumstance like today, where the expectation for the market is failure, uh, the probability that a portfolio of 10 fairly advanced stage projects is going to pay off for you is higher simply because the probability of higher mineral prices and a better market is greater from bear market bottoms than it is from bull market tops. You get to add into this investment stew, if you will, optionality. The idea that a deposit that isn't economic at today's prices could be economic at higher prices. And that type of bet has nothing to do with whether or not all those deposits will be, will be put into production at some point down the road, correct? That's true. Uh, you can make money with a deposit that returns to favor even though it's uneconomic. I remember very well at the beginning of the last cycle being instrumental in spinning Allied Nevada out of Vista Gold. If my memory serves me correctly, well of course the Vista Gold shareholders got their Allied Nevada shares for free. Those people who participated in the first financing with us, I think, paid $2.25 for those shares. As the gold price rose and as the exploration efforts of Allied Nevada proved the deposit to be larger and larger and larger, the share price ran from $2.25 to $45. 
At today's gold price, that deposit is probably uneconomic. But the move in gold that the original speculators enjoyed from the $300 price level to the $1,900 price level made the efforts successful in the context of the market that existed at the time. And people, while ultimately wrong, made fortunes. Rick, I've, I've thought about the exploration segment as having a, with well-chosen options, a 3 to 5 percent success rate, whether it be with your uh, prospect generator model companies or a big portfolio of the sole risk exploration uh, stocks. When we look at the advanced stage uh, projects, as a percentage, in your mind, a well-selected portfolio, what could be the chances percentage-wise of those going into production and themselves being a success in that, in that, in that sense? Well, I, I certainly think that there are four or five opportunities that are in front of us today that have 75 or 80 percent chances each of going into production. If you get me beyond four or five in the portfolio, then the portfolio becomes decidedly more speculative. But there's certainly um, deposits that are in our wheelhouse, if you will, deposits where our geologists have visited them, where we've interviewed managements, where we know the companies fairly thoroughly, where I would suggest that there's a 75 or 80 percent chance of each of them becoming a, becoming a mine. Uh, this again is a situation that only happens in very, very, very poor markets. Usually, if you, in a good market, have a deposit that is likely to be a mine, the market capitalization of the company assumes that it already is a mine, and all of the economic gain is taken out by the frothiness of the market. It's only in markets like these where you can find high probability advanced stage exploration deposits that would appear to be reasonably economic speculations, too. When you look around the world today, how many uh, deposits like that are out there um, that have a 70, 80 percent chance of going into production worldwide? Very few at uh, today's mineral price points. Uh, there are probably 15 or 20 that in the course of exploration over the next five years will be upgraded uh, to that status, but we of course don't know <laughs> which they are. Uh, until they've accomplished it. But I would say that there are sort of five in our wheelhouse now, uh, junior companies that have done enough exploration that we believe they're economic and that they'll be, they'll be built in the upcoming cycle. Rick, uh, what about the, uh, the segments, the producing segments, the single or multi-source uh, junior producer or the major? How do you view probability and success when you look at those groups? Well, there you're less concerned with probability and more concerned with net present value uh, and commodity price adjusted net present value, that is optionality, and process. Uh, there are teams like the Rio Alto team or the Mandalay team that, while small, seem to have the ability to either discover or buy deposits and build them and operate them profitably. Um, it's important that you buy those companies at reasonable valuations using reasonable commodity price assumptions because there's a reasonable chance that you are wrong and you should get the icing on the cake from higher commodity prices for free uh, for taking the risk associated uh, in what is a risky sector. What in your mind represents a reasonable uh, discount to net present value on a on a per share basis for those companies and what are some reasonable numbers that we should use for assumptions on these projects? Well I think the assumption has to be the current gold price. If you want to be more aggressive, which I do, you use the forward strip. Uh, that is gold is you know about twelve hundred dollars today. The forward strip three years out is thirteen hundred dollars. So the price assumption that you would use would be somewhere between twelve and thirteen hundred dollars. Uh, the discount in today's market that I would use is probably zero, uh, personally. This is a very, very, very unfrothy market. And rather than being so concerned arithmetically with a discount, what I would be much more concerned with personally would be insider ownership, 
that is whether or not the people running the company were my partners or my employees, parenthetically. I prefer partners. Uh, their track record of success and what their undeveloped project pipeline is and what the brownfields exploration potential around their existing deposit is. In other words, I'm fine not to get a spectacular bargain on their existing operations, but I want to get a fair bit of upside baked in the cake for free. When we look at, uh, at those segments, Rick, how many companies would you say are out there today that, that, that have those features? That's an interesting question that I hadn't thought of, Tokoa. Um, my suspicion is that there are 10 or 12 that are reasonably priced junior or intermediate sized producers where you get the upside for free. I have to caution you that at least half of them are in the copper business and my own personal nervousness with regards to copper in the absence of any demonstrably sustainable economic recovery is that the bias in copper is lower rather than higher and I gave you my, pro my prior answer in the context of the gold price where I think the probability is higher as opposed to lower. Rick, in some of your earlier interview materials, uh, video recordings and things, I've seen you uh, label uh, expected return uh, percentages for each of the different segments, uh, with speculation being the highest and moving downwards as you uh, move towards uh, cash. Could you uh, go through those here with uh, the person watching? Yeah, I've done that primarily as a tool to get prospective customers or existing customers to give themselves a risk-reward audit. What I've said to customers is look at the rate of return that you're hoping to achieve and assign an arbitrary risk factor to the rate of return that you're trying to achieve that's one and a half or two times greater. So an example would be if you were going to buy 10-year U.S. Treasury bonds today that would yield you a 2.3 or 2.4 percent internal rate of return. I think it's reasonable to assume that in the wrong set of circumstances that you could lose at least 5 percent of your money. If by contrast you're looking at um, uh, an S&P 500 style investment, some of the biggest industrial companies in the United States, and you had an, ex an 8 percent uh, annual internal rate of return expectation, I think that you ought to think in the context of prior bear markets and think that it would be fairly easy for you to expect a 15 percent loss if the market went in a different direction. If you were taking more risk than that, if you wanted to buy the small cap and mid cap growth companies and your rate of return expectation was 15 percent, maybe you got that from the Wilshire Index, I think that you need to be prepared to lose in that set of circumstances 25 or 30 percent of your money if things don't go your way. It's very important that you put your return expectations in the context of your capacity for risk. How much can you afford to lose, both financially and psychologically? That will give you some idea of the orientation and distribution of assets by risk in your portfolio. Rick, uh, is there anything else that you think that we may have missed? I, I think we've given it a pretty good go this time. Uh, I, I think it's a useful instruc instructional video for customers that have a life, for people who are thinking about investing but spending most of their time uh, thinking about their family, thinking about their jobs. These are the types of issues that one has to consider when considering, when thinking about investments or speculation. Rick Rule, Chairman of Sprout U.S. Holdings, thanks for sharing your comments with us. Always a pleasure, Tokoa. Thank you for facilitating this.